Thank you, Tim. And hi, Cedric. Good morning. Whoa, what is Alex got going on there? Look at that hat. <laughs> Dude, he's, living best, he's living his best life right now. Is he a rogue? Uh, I don't know if that's a rogue. I mean, that this is quite the quite the get up here. We got we got a fun hat, a, a pretty bushy <laughs> beard, uh, and some long hair. I mean, he's maybe there's something a disguise here, a rogue esque disguise here from Hame. I love it. Yeah. All right. So we're underway here. You see Sam Sifka on the top part of your screen there. Yeah. If you just took a quick glance and didn't listen to everything that, that Cedric and Tim just said, you would think that this might be a mirror match or something like that where it says both Demir rogues. But these two decks do have significant differences in the builds. How is that going to affect how the match actually plays out, Cedric? Uh, it's interesting. So I cannot claim to be a rogues master, but here's what I know. I know a lot of players like this deck, and this is a very heavily played deck between, if you split them between having Luris and not having Luris, it's the most played deck on the weekend, I believe, if memory serves. But what I will say about that is the 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 differences in the decks are so interesting because their removal suites are so different, but ultimately, from what I've heard from most players is this matchup is really hard because it's so unique. You know, we think of those fairies matchups from like a decade ago now and the back and forth there. It's similar here, but also the, the games, you know, they, are, they aren't so one-sided because the creatures aren't that powerful. Definitely. It is really interesting to see how much the matchup ends up focusing down on what end up being little tiny creatures, <laughs> but there's so many things built around them. You know, the chat was wondering, well, why are we calling these rogues deck if they only have eight rogues in them? And I think that's a fair, I mean, I don't know what we're supposed to call them, but it is true that these aren't your typical tribal decks, even the ones, uh, or especially the ones like what Alexander Hain is running. Now, if you look at Stan's list, he he is actually trending more towards, you know, an actual kind of tribal rogues deck. Yeah, uh, more so than basically anybody else here on the weekend, which is notable because as we have seen, Marshall, Sifka over the past, I'd say, I'd call it 18 months, maybe two years, maybe two years is correct. I mean, he, along with Ivan Flock uh, and Strosky, I mean, they've been breaking formats. Yes, you know, I think of the sure. Kethis, I think of the Kethis combo deck among them. And so when I see this build by Sifka, it immediately makes my my ears perk up and go, okay, wait a minute. Has he found something that no one else has? I heard God Gadwick was a standard legal card. Is that the right way to be going? Or is he off and everybody is else more everybody else's more traditional build of Demir Rogues in quotes is the right way to go? I really don't know the answer to that question, but I'm excited to find out. Yeah, I am too. And you know, the other thing to consider here was but this was very much a metagame call, right? Uh, especially if you look at the lists from some of the from the bigger teams that got together and came up with their own rogues lists. Uh, you know, I, I was talking to Luis about this, and, and he's playing this deck this weekend here in, in the rival side on Saturday. And, you know, he said, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend just picking this up and jumping in the ladder with it. You oh, know, this, yeah. this was a, a honed weapon for this particular metagame on this particular weekend. Yeah, and I totally understand and agree with that. And what's I think I agree with that statement so strongly because as I was taking a look at the deck list yesterday for both Rivals and MPL, there's nothing, there's very little consensus about what the best rogue deck is, which just mm -hmm. goes to show you that there's so much smoothing and manipulation that has to go on with each slot outside of the pretty obvious four ofs, which again are the eight rogues uh, into the story, drama the lock, and then I guess the pathways. The rest is really kind of you know, uh, up to the up to the player of the deck. And and I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, and I agree with Le Luis's sentiment and the same one that you're making here, which is this is not just a pick up and, hey, I'm just going to copy Luis's deck and now I'm going to win like Luis does. I don't think so. Right. Not quite like that. As we see Stanislav Sifko with the lead at the moment, he does have a soaring thought thief as well as a Thieves Guild enforcer on the battlefield and applying at least deck pressure here to Alexander Hain, if not Life total, Alex is still at 19 life. Uh, but you can see that Alex's hand is stacked. He is ready to roll with this uh, Blood Chief's Thirst. He has another copy of that in his hand, as well as Heartless Act and Drown in the Lock. And you can see why people look at this and go, really, rogues? Because <laughs> this plays out like a blue-black kind of a, a tempo deck, right? A deck that can, in many ways, play on your opponent's turn uh, and then try to lean on another card in Alex's hand, which is into the story to, to reload and kind of finish off the game. I think that's the most important card in game one, is into the story. Uh, and I'm not saying you have to turn it on quickly, but I will say that it is just, I mean, four cards for ideally four man. I mean, that's a heck of a deal. Um, what's interesting about the rogue creatures in this matchup is, you know, their text, right? These guild enforcers are going to mill a couple of cards. Soaring Thought Thief is going to mill a couple more. But are those cards dealing the 20? M my lean is no. And, and the reason I feel that way, Marshall, is because 
look how much removal Hain has in hand. You already mentioned the first Blood Chief's Thirst. There's a second one. There's a Heartless Act. There's a Drown the Lock. And these creatures are one and two power creatures that I can't imagine they're dealing the full 20. So how right. are they winning these games is the big question. Right. And and that's what we get to see unfold in front of us here. And again, you know, it is interesting. Uh, one of the big differences in build as well, you can see right away, there's a Luris down in the com companion zone there for Alexander Hain. You yep. won't see that on Sifka's side or on many of the, the builds that you'll see, um, primarily making the way for Shark Typhoon to, yep. to be a thing, which is kind of funny because they almost never cast it as a permanent <laughs> even though that that's the restriction that it breaks for Luris. it's like no I, what if i only cycle it right then can i still have Luris? and the answer of course is no uh but we do see gadwick as the wizard as well another uh heavy hitter for stanislav sifkin a card that could try to take over in the later part of the game as we see shark typhoon produce a three three shark oh there's our boy, though. Yeah, there's their Sam. Sam. Trickster. <laughs> That's a sweet one. And you got to feel like if if Stan can connect with that, it could put him ahead for good. That said, nothing going for it right now. Zara Sam has kind of a ninjutsu ability, but it only counts for rogues, not sharks, unfortunately. And Alex is going to use Heartless Act to try to just take out this shark right here. Now, one thing I was mentioning kind of at the top uh, as we're working ourselves into the mid-game, and I'm expecting these Demir Rogues games and these mirrors to be pretty lengthy, basically, always. So we'll have plenty of time to kind of dissect the gameplay. The trade-off between Luris versus Shark Typhoon. Uh, let's talk about that, because you have to pick one or the other. Now, what's interesting about that to me is that Luris, if we're going to play this kind of I-can-kill-all-your-creatures game, well, Luris goes, uh, hey, I'm happy to play this game. I'm just going to get these knuckleheads back, and eventually you're going to run out of removal, right? Um, oh. Versus Shark Typhoon, which is definitely powerful in spots, and you would think it would be powerful in a matchup like this, but when there's so much removal just kind of running around, I mean, think about that first Shark Typhoon. A 3-3, cycle, draw a card, and Hane just goes, all right, well, I'm just going to kill that. I'm not really that worried about it. And then it, it, I'm not saying it's bad, but it just makes you question how effective it is in this matchup. Maybe the first one's not so good, but perhaps the second and third one are versus... Is that card going to be better than just having access to a Luris? Right. That's yeah, the big you know, question. And that's the big question that these players have to ask themselves because they have to look at the way that the game actually plays out most likely, right? And like right now we see Alexander Hain very reluctantly using a Drown in the Lock to mm -hmm. take care of an end step flashed in Zarathan. He didn't have anything amazing in his yard, but Zarathan can get any permanent. So even just taking a land, you know, can put Stanislav Sivka in a good position. And with no other answer in hand at the moment, Alex decided to fire it off. Yeah, and when you were playing this kind of attrition-y back and forth game, um, where you're basically trading all these resources and then, you know, person resolves into the story and then they're gassing back up or activating Castle Lockvane and gassing back up that way, Zara Sand can kind of put a little bit of a crimp into that because it is going to be drawing cards in a different kind of way. Uh, that is worth noting. So as we see here, you know, we both players basically have, I don't want to say they've exhausted all of the resources, but we're getting to the point now where one of these players, and Alexander Hain, has an into the story and Sifka does not, and that could be the game breaker. Now, of course, Gatwick is a way to draw cards as well, uh, but that's a main phase way to do it, um, which is not as good in my estimation as into the story and its instant speed capabilities. Yeah, interesting here because Sifka with with that Gadwick, you know, right now Alex actually doesn't have any way to interact. And mm -hmm. had Sifka just said, screw it, I'm going for it, would have been really happy with the result of that. But boy, that's a tough sell when you Definitely have no idea sell. what's going on in your opponent's hand. Yeah. Now, well, one part two copies of Into the Story here, Cedric, for, for Alex. Looks like the late game is, is his, at least currently. And there's a Drown in the Lock now on top of the library as well. Yeah, very, very, I, I think, favorable position here for Hain. Uh, and again, you see Soaring Thought Thief coming. Uh, you're going to see Thieves Guild Enforcer. Remember that he did keep he did keep the Drown in the Lock on top. So now there's going to be a mill trigger. So now do you... Do you do you into the story now? The answer is no. So we're going to lose that Drown the Lock. But now here is into the story. So now four cards coming Drown the Lock among them. Uh, so there's also that little back and forth, right, too, Marshall, where it's like, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll Temple, I'll leave a card on top. It's like, well, milling cards is easy for this Rogues deck. So your Temple Scries are really not all that safe. No, and it really interesting to see uh, that that Drown the Lock is is now, there is one in hand now for Alexander Hain, but he's completely tapped out at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, took advantage of that open window. But you know what? Gadwick's at the door, and he's going to slam it down because that was huge as yeah. we see Sifka reload with five fresh cards in hand. 
So what felt like was potentially advantage Hain because he was going to have the opportunity to resolve into the story first, it feels like it's now more advantage Sifka because he's actually got the creatures in the battlefield. And again, both players have access to so much removal, but what, what you see in Hain's hand is he's only got one removal spell for one of these three problematic creatures, and with Hain's life total somewhat low at seven, eh, this one might be getting away from him a little bit. Yeah, one of the interesting dynamics that you'll see over the course of the weekend, too, is what we saw Stanislav Sifka do, which is force the issue on Hain. So, you know, when, when, you, when you're looking down at your end of the story, you need, you need your opponent to have seven cards in their library, which I know is a little weird because we're used to eight cards from rogues, but for whatever reason, in the story cares about having seven, you know, we <laughs> yeah. threshold or whatever. But with that main deck cling to dust for Sifka, it allows him to clean out his graveyard kind of at will, right? You have to exile, I think, five cards with cling to dust. Yeah, it's quite a few. Right. And if that's the case, that end of the story, which remember, Hain had two of that would only cost four mana each. If you look at his hand in the lower left, it costs seven again now. And that's because Sifka proactively made that happen. So that's kind of the situation that Sifka is trying to deal with. He's trying to manage both his own resources, both in hand and on battlefield. But also it's important to note that he has cling to dust to manage his own graveyard, which can actually mess with Alex's game plan in a pretty significant way. And perhaps that's why we're seeing players play more than one main deck copy of that card. Now, that card is just kind of good in a general sense, but playing multiples of that card, at least for me, feels slightly strange. But if that's a key way to get an edge in the rogue's mirror, which is, hey, I'm controlling my own graveyard, which means you're into the stories, always cost seven. Mm -hmm. Well, then, OK, I'm, a I'm actually interested in having the conversation about that. And it's kind of a weird way to look at things. But, you know, managing your own graveyard in a unique way with Cling to Dust could be a mirror breaker in which there are very few mirror breakers. Exactly. And, and, you know, th that is one of the ways that you can get an advantage and it doesn't demand much of you. You often get your card back and it only costs one black mana the first time around. That said, it is a valuable slot in your deck. And look at this shark typhoon on the battlefield here for Sifka. <laughs> I spoke too soon, said. <laughs> so what I was actually thinking when you were mentioning shark typhoon, because I know your love of I wanting love to resolve shark charge. typhoon. Yeah. But what I was thinking when you were talking about that is maybe that's the way to go about doing business in this matchup. Because think about what we saw at the 2020 season grand finals. Seth Manfield saying, hey, if my opponent, re if my opponent revolves, resolves, excuse me, Lucky Clover, I can't get it off the battlefield. I can't do anything, and I'm eventually going to lose the game to it. Now, Lucky Clover costs two, or Shark Typhoon costs six. But the same thing is kind of at play, which is blue-black decks have a real difficulty getting enchantments and artifacts off the battlefield. So now there's a Shark Typhoon on the battlefield. What's the plan to get that out of here? I don't know. Right. That, that's that's really interesting because, you know, we have seen lately that Black has started to dip its toe into messing around with enchantments. Not artifacts still, but it's enchantments. Yep. But I don't think that Alex, for example, has, uh, has any way to actually mess with it. I'm looking right now at his, his list and yeah, there's nothing here. Yeah, the thing you're looking for, I mean, you're looking for a Brazen Borrower to, potem to temporarily bounce it. You're looking for uh, Feed the Swarm and the Cyborg to, to get rid of it, that sort of thing. Not going to find either here for Hain. So now that Shark Typhoon's on the battlefield, uh, and presumably there are going to be more sharks coming, <coughs> like a 7-7 seven, seven one. Wow. The plan, are we, I, think the, I think the plan now is we, we shift to wow. milling. I'm so, like... I'm just really proud and happy for Sifka right now. Like <laughs> a four mana into the story with Shark Typhoon on the battlefield. <laughs> Whee! And you're right, by the way, milling absolutely has to be the game plan at this point. And, you know, after Alexander Hain um, resolved uh, Agadim's Awakening last turn, that completely reloaded his board, right? He got back Luris plus Soaring Thought Thief plus Thieves Guild Enforcer. And then that leaves you the Luris one time play for the turn and that gets you another soaring thought thief and all of a sudden sifka staring down a board that's pretty darn good here no absolutely and so i caught just a little bit because you and i can't hover over either player's decks sifka has 22 cards left okay okay and what's interesting about this is now we're now it's all for me i, I think and for hane it's about if i if i'm in hane spot and i'm wearing a top hat um i'm looking <laughs> and i'm seeing okay my opponent has 22 cards Wait, are you do you have I, a top? I, I, I am not wearing a top hat, just a headset, my friend. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> well, my opponent probably can't afford to draw cards, right? They can't fire off a big Gatwick. 
casting into the story might be a little bit too risky because it, it's about deck damage now because I, I think attacking, I mean, Sifka's in 20 anyway, so attacking is probably off the table. So now if you're Sifka, Sifka has to start, in my estimation, of killing Luris yes. and then worrying about all the other stuff that's going on because if you kill any other rogues, obviously Luris can just get them back. Uh, so Hain is going to be focusing on deck damage now, and now I wonder about what Sifka is going to do with his card drawing spells and how he's going to play them. If he's going to try to, I guess you know, thin, uh, you know, walk the thread, um, split the double team, whatever you want to say, and draw a couple of cards, but not all the cards. Right, and this is going to be really interesting because what you'll often see is when we get to this point in the game, and this is part of the reason why you saw Alex so uh hesitant to use drown in the lock even in the earlier part of the game is that that's his primary way to deal with anything that could deal with Luris. because as long as Luris stays on the battlefield you know alex can do some pretty weird stuff like he can just start attacking the soaring thought thieves in just for the mill yeah they run into some big shark and he can just buy them back with Luris every turn he can chump lock every turn with one of those on a big shark and then buy it back now as it stands it feels like Sifka has too big of an advantage in the air over the course of the last couple of turns, thanks to Shark Typhoon. Because, yeah, Alex theoretically has the way to to win the game if Laura stays on the battlefield. But it looks more like Alex is just going to be dead here before that happens because of the the Shark Typhoon. Well, I was going to agree with you until one of the cards that was drawn off of Instant Story, which was, <laughs> was Extinction Event. event? Oh, yes. Man. And that's absolutely crucial. So here's what you were talking about, about sending in the Soaring Thought Thieves, right? Now, in this instance, these are going to die. Well, maybe, maybe, because again, with Sifka He actually wants them 20, dead, doesn't he? <laughs> I mean, Hain wants them to die. Yeah. I don't know if Sifka knows that. Oh, this, oh, man, Hain's got to be loving this. Oh. 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 Big brain Sifka. Hain would love for these to die. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and they're not currently. Sivka went for the snap block, 3-3 three, three, and 7-7, seven, seven, and now he's reconsidered, and look how smart he is. Really, really, really sharp play from Sivka, because Hain would love for these to be in the graveyard to get them back with Luris, but Sivka took a step back, said, I'm not going to do that. So now, and oh, Hain that hasn't was played a land such yet. A sweet play. That was, that was actually pretty sick. Yeah. Sivka's just patting himself on the back like, knew it figured it out, not falling for it. Because that is huge, right? Getting those two Soaring Thought Thieves exiled, you know, for Alexander Hain means that that Luris just has a lot less impact. Yep. So this Luris is still fine. Not the best thing we've ever seen. Uh, and you see Hain's taking a look at the graveyard there. There might be, yeah, there's at least one Thieves Guild Enforcer. So still some milling to be done. But yeah, as we mentioned, he's on deck damage now. Taking a look at Sifka's hand. Gadwick, uh, kind of an F. Brazen Borrower, eh. Not great. Lands, Thieve Guild Enforcer. I mean, we're looking at a pretty weak hand here, Marsh. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's interesting because Sifka playing around that extinction event there, I mean, that's some super high-level stuff, and that has a really good shot of winning in the game here. Now he can fire off another big Gadwick, and, uh, and looks like he could find a way to win the game pretty easily from here. Yeah, I mean, trying to thread the needle, drawing a couple of cards, but not getting milled out. So, okay, Luris finally down, removal spell found there in Heartless Act. Um, and now it, it seems like Hain's probably in some trouble, but he's got some pretty good cards in hand, some, some removal spells. Can he race this Shark Typhoon by milling Sifka out without access to Luris now? He's in, He's at five. It's so difficult from here. You know, there's also that Gadwick over there, which threatens to tap down opposing blockers. and. Right now, Sifka really doesn't need to clear much out of the way to get the job done. Even after this exchange, he would have lethal on the board. So we're going to see a bit of an interesting turn, I think, on Hain's turn. So Hain's going to Hain's going to try to trade his Thieves Guild Enforcer with the Thieves Guild Enforcer that's attacking. You mentioned the Gadwick and now the Shark Token, right? So if we go to Hain's turn and Hain, Hain let's say Hain kicks his turn off with, into the story, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you counter it? We drown the lock? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I asked that because, okay, so we counter into the story and then Hain just goes, all right, I'll kill both your creatures with Drown the Lock and Haragon Smalling, right? Now, uh -huh. if, Sif if Sifka says you're into the story resolves and you can do whatever you want to because I've got two Thieves Guild Enforcers that can do lethal if all my stuff dies. Oh, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. The two Thieves Guild Enforcers are lethal, aren't they? 
Yeah. Now this is this is all upside too for Sifka. He is going to go ahead and counter here because you get the two two also. That's a very very good point. And it looks like we may see a counter back here, mm-hmm. but this is the problem, right? Is that is that Alex let Sifka hit that uh, Shark Typhoon on the battlefield, and now whenever they have a fight, right? Whenever they they duke it out on the stack over whether a spell resolves, Sifka ends up with like a two two and a three three at the end of it, even if he loses the fight. This is true. This is true. No, so Sifka kind of sat up in his chair a little bit there. Hain fought back. So drown the lock, counter drown the lock, into the story resolved, drew a couple of cards. Hain has one, two, three, four, five. Hasn't played land yet, so access to six mana. Don't have a great feel for Sifka's deck. If I had to guess, it's under 10 cards. Um, and if I'm Hain, I can kill Gadwick and go to one. Not a great position to be in, but it certainly beats the alternative. So he's going to go for that here. Hagra Malin is going to take out Gadwick, leaving two, two, two sharks. And Hain knows that at least as the board sits, it's not going to get any worse for that for him. He does get to play a two, three blocker here. So tentatively stable. But I think if you're Alexander Hain, you don't expect to untap with this soaring thought thief. And uh, if that's the case, then you're going to be at one facing down at least two lethal threats. In this case, it looks like it's going to be closer to four. Oh, and I wonder I, if Hain so, is getting close to being decked out here. Hain is getting decked out. He's got five cards left, and if a hard cast brazen borrower, Agadim's Awakening bring back more, brings back more rogues, excuse me, the game is going to end. So we were so focused on Sifka mm-hmm. dealing damage this game to win the game that Hain is actually going to get milled out. You mean, I mean, you want to talk about a complicated mirror, wow. man. Wow, look at all that. <laughs> He's got like six triggers off of the Thieves Guild Enforcers. An easy game there for Stanislav Sivka. And, you know, I have to say, Cedric, that it was also Alex who had to worry about dying, right, to, yeah. to actual damage. And if that's the case, then he needed to divert a bunch of his resources to not just dying to that Shark Typhoon. And that left the window open for Sivka to have a huge turn with Alexander Hain completely locked out there, and he was able to get the job done and uh, – and, and mill him out there at the end. So, both these players are going to sideboard up, uh, and a card that you're going to be seeing here is Skyclave Shade, which is a card a lot of people have been talking about from the mirror because it's a card that gets milled, or you can bring it back with Landfall, kick it, bring something back, so on and so forth. I mean, this card is a really good card in the mirror, unquestionably, but, again, this mirror is immensely complicated. You and I just commentated on a game where we're talking about, okay, well... Let's do all this other stuff with attacking versus milling. We think Hain's going to try to mill him out. Hain ends up getting milled out. I don't know which way it's going to go. I mean, I, I think the Skycliff Shade is very good. Negates are good. Disputes are good. But I mean, the back and forth of these games is, it, it's outrageous. Yeah, it really is. And and this has, you know, I saw somebody in chat asking earlier, wait a second, there's Rogue's deck that don't play Brazen Borrower? Oh, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> there are in this case one of them actually is it's funny Sifka's playing brazen borrower and that in some ways makes him the less represented group here <laughs> as uh, many of the decks have have not played it which which does sound completely absurd right the power level of brazen borrower and the fact that it fits into the rogues deck so well yet there's players who aren't even touching it including Hain. I mean, it's funny because I, by that, that question is a totally fair one. Brazen Borrower is a mythic rare. It's incredibly powerful. We've seen it a lot ever since it got printed in Throne of Eldraine. And I would counter that question with, there are rogue decks that do play Brazen Borrower? Which is a ridiculous <laughs> thing to say. It is true, though, right? Like, yeah. when, when I first looked at Sifka's list, I'm like, Brazen Borrower? What is this guy doing? Yeah, somebody's really feeling it over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with their awesome bounce plus three one that kills people. Yeah. So we'll see how things go here post board as we work our way into uh, into game number two. Stanislav Sivka having picked up his first game against Alexander Hain, ultimately by applying pressure on two axes, which we'll see a lot, especially in these Demir mirrors. It's a weird dynamic. Normally, you know, when you play uh, really any constructed format, you want to be as cohesive and linear as possible, right? You, you don't want a deck that's like, I might mill you or I might kill you with damage. You never know, right? Usually yeah. it's like, you want to know exactly 
what the deck is trying to do. But this rogues deck, um, it doesn't. It it sometimes wins through damage and it sometimes wins through mill. And you can kind of uh, tune your deck to to what end you want to go on. For example. Alex isn't running any ruin craps where you will see lists over the course of this weekend that are uh, just as another card that's optional, but, but some people play, some people don't. Yeah. And I'm wondering as we're seeing an agonizing remorse resolve here. So again, a pretty good look is Alex uh, at Sifka's hand. I'm wondering Marshall at the end of this weekend, if we're going to have a consensus opinion about ruin crap, uh, if it should be in these rogues decks or not, because think about the game we just watched. There were no ruin crabs on either side, and both players were very close to getting milled out in a very long, drawn-out game because they're drawing cards and then the opponents are milling them. Um, so it's not that ruin crab is bad. It's uh, in a way for me, it's just kind of like, well, why is it necessary? Yeah, you know, I think the idea is what what deck do you want to beat? Right. Because, you know, if you played against Yorian on turn one, it'll sit there for a really long time and it'll mill them a lot. Mm -hmm. If you play them in this matchup, there's so many ways to kill it if the opponent thinks that it's a problem and it doesn't apply quite enough pressure right itself just with the one land per turn for the most part that it's either ignorable or easily killable if it if it's going to be a problem. And to me, you know, you're going to need to do a little bit better than that in these type of matchups. And so that's why I think that you'll see a lot of players not playing it in that they're taking a little bit more well-rounded of an approach to the format. But if you're the type of, wow, that's aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that said? Yeah, Alex yeah. just activated Castle Lockwin with five cards in hand. Yo, how much would you, how much life would you pay for a card? I mean, I would pay that much, but I'm like <laughs> not as good as Alex. <laughs> but anyway, I think the the I think we need to reverse engineer the lists, right? If you see people playing Ruin Crab, the real question is what was that player trying to beat rather than it should it just be in here or is it a good card or whatever? Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I don't know if we'll find a consensus at the end of this weekend, um, because again, and, and again, the deck list for everybody who's watching at home or over at magic.gg, uh, I took a long look at them yesterday, and the biggest thing I found was just these rogue deck lists. I mean, they're all over the place, Not, and that's not in like a mean-spirited way. It's just some players feel really strongly about some stuff, and some players feel really strongly about other things. Um, and who knows? I mean, I've, some lists have two rune crabs, some have four, some have zero. Yep. It is, it is bizarre. And, and, you know, and, and then of course there's a list like we, like we've seen here from Sifka with Zerastan, Zerastan and uh Brazen Borrower. And then there's some that don't have any of those cards in it. So who knows? Uh, hopefully we'll get some answers by the end of the weekend. In the meantime, Hain, uh use that one extra card he got down to 13 life, but uh, he's on <laughs> Salt Thief chipping in and starting to do the old deck damage, as you put it. Cedric, in the meantime, Castle Vantress is going to get activated. So some kind of non-turns here for our for our players, uh, really at the stage of the game where you expect them to be doing more proactive things, but there's a lot of your turn, right? I, I'm not going to do anything because I can cast things on your turn. And if that's the case and you haven't used your mana, well, you better use it, right? I, you know, yep. he knows it is a very big tax. Yeah, paying five life, six life to draw a card is rough. But what's also rough is not doing anything with your mana for an entire turn cycle, you know, when you've got four mana available. Yeah, and a mirror that looks like this, which, you know, there are some tribal elements and some creature elements here, so it's not just a flat control mirror uh, like we've seen Demir controllers or his control mirrors in the past. But this this aspect of, of those things still remains the same, which is you don't want to miss your land drops here. So Hain paying a lot of life to draw a card looks weird, but obviously he's saying, you know what? I've got, oh my God, he's doing it again. <laughs> he's, saying, <laughs> he's saying, I'm going to use my mana and he's I don't want to miss seven. my land drops. What is going on? <laughs> Incredible. I love seeing this. You know, this shows that Alex is viewing this game from a different perspective. He thinks that Sifka has sideboarded into a much more controlling uh, deck, a Demir control deck, if you will. And I'll tell you, Cedric, if I sat you down, right, to play against a player and I said they're on blue-black control, right, that, that's a deck they're playing. In other words, you're not taking incidental damage almost ever from a deck like that. So you can really use your life total as a resource. Now, Alex is taking that to the next level here, right? He spent, what, 12 or 13 life or whatever just to, to draw a couple of cards. But that's what you would do, right? Because going down to one against a control deck usually isn't a big deal. I agree. I do. and when you know when you know your opponent, 
uh, mm-hmm. and what they're and what they're playing because you know we're talking open deck list here. It's like okay, so what ways can my opponent beat me? Well, I got to make sure I don't lose to some sort of flash threat or you know cycled shark typhoon for one stuff like that. And those are all things that Hayne knows Sif has access to. So it's not like he's just doing this and then oh man, if these guild enforcer, who knew? You know, like, right? That's not yeah. happening. What I think is happening is that Hayne. Oh, okay. So he's he knows a couple of cards from Sifka, so we know that part. But also, I think he's just assuming that Sifka is going transformative here and is taking those cards out. I think Hayne is just saying, you know what? There's no way you have, you know, a whole bunch of Thieves Guilds enforcers and <clears throat> uh, Soaring Thought Thieves in post board. I think that you're going a different direction where you're bringing in Essence Scatters, like I see here in hand for Sifka. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to risk it. And so far, he's been exactly right. There's a Skyclave Shade and a Shark Typhoon, though, so those will throw a bit of a wrench in the works. Yeah, wrench is a good word to use here because this game has gotten significantly more difficult, uh, which Hain doesn't know, but Skyclave Shade and Shark Typhoon are both in very, very good cards. In a game that looks like this, you know, Shark Typhoon may be catching Hain by surprise. Not so much in, in like, Hain didn't know it was coming, but, like, when you were at 7, you wouldn't care if you were at 16. And then Skyclave Shade uh, can kind of muck things up a little bit here. So those, those I would say those were two good uh, good draws there from Sifka. Yeah, you know, I do assume that Sifka, that, that Hain is right also, and that Sifka's much lighter on threats than he would be, than he was, excuse me, in the first game. And if that's the case... Well, he just drew two threats off the top after having a hand that didn't have any. I mean, Gadwick can get in, but is also a difficult spell to resolve in situations like this. So, you know, right now, Hain is sitting on a drown in the lock and kind of leaning hard on it right now. And Sifka's just going to take his time. You know, he's not under a ton of pressure himself. Yeah, and that's kind of the tough thing. Like, I have, I have no problem with what Hain's doing with his Castle Lock main, Um, But, you know, you would traditionally do something like that where, like, you're kind of snowballing a pretty big advantage, right? Where it's just like, okay, I'm beat you down. You know, you're at 10. You're at 6. Yeah, I'll pay 7 left to draw a card because I just want to try to get this game over with. Uh, and this is, like, a critique that has nothing to do with either player but with rogues in general, which is, yeah, Soren thought he was a 1-3. So th- it's not like the game ends all that quickly when you're trying to snowball your advantage. It's like, all right, you're at... 16, you're at 14. So it looks like that. Wow, look at this play here from Alexander Hain. He just paid for Luris's uh, companion fee plus Luris and has now left the shields down outside of Mystical Dispute. That's the only card that Sifka has to think about in this situation as he sends in with the, the shade here. Well, if you got to read, you got to read and you say, hey, I think, and this is what you were talking about earlier, right? You think that Sifka has cyborged into a lot of counter spells. Uh, Mm -hmm. less creatures, potentially less removal. And so if you've got to read that, hey, I'm going to pay Luris the companion cost, play it. I have Dispute Up, which can't defend me against all that much. But look, this is what I think is is going on. It it, it looks genius. Look at what, I mean, Alexander Hain is playing this awesome. That was such a sick play. He left one mana up against an opponent that could have seven mana available and just said, go for it because I know you can't cast a a reasonable Gadwick for this. And I know you can't resolve a shark typhoon full stop. Now the real question comes on, does he have the answers to deal with the inevitable, you know, shark uh, in the air, that kind of thing. And the answer is, yeah, he's got two drown on the lock and a neutralize. Man, that was, that was a sweet play there from Alex. Yeah, I was curious if he was actually going to pay three life again. He's been aggressive with his life total, but this time, uh, Agadim's <laughs> Awakening is just going to go uh, and ETB tapped. A little, little bit conservative there, Mr. Hain. <laughs> Indeed. So here it is. This is the big Shark Typhoon, and it's also perfectly sized here at four, giving him seven power on the board. This is a must kill, and you can see that Alex, again, playing tight here. There's still the... Uh, the draw a card from the cycling on Shark Typhoon, and Alex is just going to make sure that it goes away. Like that. Now, there's a lot riding on that last round in the locker. <laughs> there's also a neutralized too. So, and of course, if Alex can keep this situation alive, he's fine. The shade hits for three, but he gets to crack back with Luris and gain the three back. So it's not like he's losing life total here. And remember, the shade can't block, so it's not like Sifka can try to change gears here. He just has to keep sending in with the thing. And he's got to come up with another way to pressure Hain's life total. And if he can, he may be able to finish this game. Otherwise, Hain's going to be in good shape. Ooh, okay. Well, just play the land. So there's Skyclave Shade in the graveyard that oh, hello. can be recast. So 
That's that's very good. That that yeah. would leave him with eight power up, and that would be able to overcome even the lifelink here from Luris. So that that is going to be a must answer and a problem for Hain going forward for sure. Mm-hmm. It's a really, really, really good card in the mirror. Yeah, it, honestly, I'm looking at it like, hmm, that's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just consi- a it's consistently a problem. Yeah. Oh, it looks like it's just a, a three three a three one here though. He didn't pay the kicker cost on it, so he actually doesn't quite have lethal after the Luris connects. Yeah, but three one's still okay. You know, it, he's got a lot of things to do with his mana. Here's a drain the lock on the oh. Luris. Okay, so yeah, and let's, also let's cancel start that this order. Up. Yeah, let's yeah, start let's, this show up. Let's get lethal going. This, by the way, is Alex's upkeep. This is Sifka. Just playing tight, if you're relatively new to the game, you can do things on your opponent's upkeep. And the key here is that this is before Alex has drawn his card for the turn. So he can, you know, fire off a Drown in the Lock and not let Alex have the chance to draw another counterspell during his draw step. Well, Marshall, you mentioned how important this Drown in the Lock is here for Hain. And so now he's going to use it to keep his Luris alive. Now a little bit of a counter war that Payne is going to win because he he has access to disputes where uh, Sifka really doesn't at this stage right. of the game. So right. that's really key, right? Because the neutralize is a nice hard counter, but getting some value out of the mystical disputes, a pretty big game here. You look over and Sifka has a lot of lands on the battlefield. That said, how great has mystical dispute been? Right, it it's kept a shark typhoon from resolving. Even though Sifka saw through it, it still did its job. And Gadwick, the wizard, has sat in hand forever here for Sifka because the threat of mystical dispute just makes it so much worse. Yep, it's looked good. And now you know, as this game got, kind of goes back and forth a little bit, as Skyclave Shade is the draw here for Sifka number three, and we've talked about how good Skyclave Shade is in this matchup. Well, take a look at Sifka's life total, seven. Yeah, yeah um, he's he's getting down there. So no like now he's sight. being raced. Yeah, he's got there. He is sky clay shades can't block, uh, and those are obviously good at attacking. So you're gonna attack with it. I don't know if he's gonna block. I don't think he's incentivized to block. Oh, I think he just says sure. I'll go to one. Okay. I mean, he's he's the one who spent whatever twelve thirteen life to draw a couple cards. He doesn't <laughs> mind going to one at all. Yeah, this is kind <laughs> of his own fault, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed. Now, one key card here is cling to dust in the yard. Is there a target, a creature, uh, perhaps in the graveyard here that uh, that Sifka can hit to gain the three life? That's a good question. That would narrowly put him out of range of lethal. I think we just had that question answered, and I think it's no. So now here's here's a oh, this is the this is the babiest of Gadwicks here. So this is literally just a three mana Gadwick. Mm hmm. And Hain, boy, interesting situation. He yeah, looks like he's going to try to fire off a neutralize here. If this resolves, he will win this game as it sits, right? I don't think that there's... Oh, is there... Oh, there's enough mana here for Sifka for that cling. Okay, okay, we got a game. Okay. Well, but there's no creature to cling. I, I think he can cling his own, right? Mm, well, he's ta- he's into the story now. So. Nope, I guess he can't. Yeah. <laughs> Because he just fired off into the story. <laughs> Let me bring up Kling on my screen here. But yeah, I, am doing the I think that's going to be thing. game here for Alexander Hain. It's looking very good. Yeah, he can cling his own card. I, I always think about clinging um, your opponents. Yeah, you, you are allowed to, oh. though. He, it looked like he decided that that wasn't the way that, that this was going to go. I partially thought that that was part of the reason why he uh, went for the Gadwick there. Why keep his uh, keeping his mana up? Because if it did hit the yard, then he'd for sure have a target. But it looks like that wasn't the case. That is uh, going to do it for game number two. We're going to get a game number three. As the player's sideboard here, we're going to take a quick 30-second break. We'll be back with more right after this. And welcome back. Uh, talking with Chad a little bit about that last play. Um, also possible, you know, I didn't see how many cards Sifka had in the yard. I'm assuming he had enough to to uh, 
escape the cling, but not 100% sure. Yeah, me either. And what's going to make this tough for us here in the booth and you viewers at home, especially when we're watching a rogue's mirror, is we can't click on the graveyard uh, or hover over the library to see how many cards are hiding out over there. So we're guessing as best we can here to present a narrative um, with with Kling and everything that's graveyard related, Luris into the story, blah, blah, blah. Um, what, what my takeaway from all of that is, however, is it's complicated, man. It's co- this this matchup. You know, Jerry Thompson, uh, in an article he wrote this week, he said that this is one of the most complicated mirrors he's ever, co- most complicated mirrors he's ever seen in his entire magic career. Uh, and that's saying something, because he is not one that is prone to hyperbole. Um, this thing is tough. Uh, is it about milling? Is it about damage? Is it about counters? Is it about removal? How much of each are you supposed to have after cyborg? How much card drawing? Are you supposed to pay seven life to draw a card? I don't know. Right. Yeah, that, I, I got to say, there's two things. So, by the way, uh, working through that last situation further, we do know that he had enough cards in the yard for Kling because the Soaring Thought Thieves were getting pumped up, as uh, as as Kenji points out in the chat. And then also, though, I've got to bring the focus back on Alex. My God, he played that game awesome. Like, yeah. <laughs> you you have to know really what's going on right? He needed all of the resources that he ended up having at the end of the game. That includes the two cards that he drew in the middle part of the game that cost him a huge chunk of life. And it also included that one turn where he tapped down to just the one blue mana against somebody with seven mana and understood that there was nothing devastating that could happen because of, um, of, of his mystical dispute in hand. And yeah, that takes guts. I, you know, you really have to understand to be able to go, you know what? I'm going to do, I'm going to just go ahead and tap down to one mana here against a player with five cards and seven freaking lands on the battlefield. And I'm good. That's incredible stuff from uh, Alex. I totally agree with you. I, I, it's, it's notable. Uh, so the fun thing about that, that whole thing from Alex last game is just like, hey, if you're wrong, this looks real bad. Yep. Um, and if you're right, this looks real good. Uh, and perhaps he doesn't care about what other people think, and, and kudos to him if that's the case. But I'll say, for us commentating the game, like, paying 7 life and then 6 life, it's like, uh, and they died from a 5-5 five, five shark. It's like, well, right. what's going on? You it's know, right. but it ends up looking really good, and he won by the skin of his teeth, but hey, that's how he drew up the game. Yeah, I mean, Alex is a rogue. We know that based on the hat that he's wearing and the deck that's that he true. chose. And he... It looks like it's funny. This is flipped around. Now Alex has Sky Slave, uh, Sky Clave Shade attacking, and on the other side is Soaring Thought Thief from Sifka, perhaps back in the list here, and it's beating down and milling out Alex. What is going on? Yeah. So one thing that was interesting is on turn two, Hain was thinking about playing a Temple instead of playing the Shade, and eventually said, "You know what? I'm just going to play the Pathway on tap, play the Shade, and let's just get, let's just get the beatdowns going." Which, again, the games are pretty drawn out. Uh, so if you can get a 3-1 on the battlefield on turn two, that basically doesn't die. Um, there's some value in doing so. And so now Haynes is going to keep trucking on in and playing this kind of, hey, I have a 3-1 that you don't really want to kill, that mm-hmm. I can consistently get back, and then keep up a wall of interaction. It's not always going to be counter magic. There will be some card draw involved. There will be some removal involved. But I have a wall of interaction and a 3-1 that you can't really kill. Let's see if this gets the game over with. And we see... Alex finally acting here. Heartless Act is going to take down the Soaring Thought Thief on the other side of the battlefield, but that will leave a shark token. It's just a 2-2 for now. And you can see that Agadim's Awakening in hand here for Sifko. He probably doesn't mind a few of these creatures going to the graveyard if he wants to try to get value out of that down the line. Yep. The the race is quote on unquote. I mean, it's mm-hmm. not the fastest race we've ever seen, but no. It, but, but it is a race, in my opinion, nonetheless. Because hey, we're just going to do this. Tacky for three. Tacky for two. Tacky like, for three. And then there's going to be a, a big swell, probably. As a mono green aggro player, are you like embarrassed for these two? Or I mean, it's it's tough for these two out here. I mean, I prefer <laughs> to attack in chunks of five to nine points of damage at a time. But hey, but have different strokes for different folks. <laughs> I know. Alex is like Cedric. Look, it's three power for only two mana. Check this out. <laughs> Like here, hold hold my Arnold Palmer. <laughs> I'll show you what it's about. Well, both players continue to kind of peck away at each other's life totals. Eleven for Sifka, fourteen for Hain, and there's no sign of it stopping. At least for now, they've got pretty reactive hands. Uh-huh. Hmm. 
going to play a land here. Yeah. I'm curious to see which person kind of, I guess I'll say blinks first. Mm-hmm. Um, is there going to be a time should be a Stan. I think it has to be Stan, right? Well, okay. So now that that's a that's a good draw. Clean the dust because clean the dust mm-hmm. can take your shade if it gets killed, and it'll change the dynamic of the game. Right there, you go. So yeah, that that'll be a life total swing as well as a board affecting swing here for for Sifka. Yeah, that clean the dust was a nice one. Now <clears throat> he would have to use at this point drown in the lock to kill the shade, and what you'll notice is. If you haven't played with the Demir Rogues deck, any version of it, these are very much Drown in the Lock decks. That is one of the most powerful cards in the deck, and it's one of the reasons to play the deck. At most points of the game after the first few turns, it's basically a hard counter for anything or a hard removal spell for anything. It is incredibly powerful in the mid to late game as the most flexible answer we've really had in standard in a long time. I mean... I, maybe ever, at least in this color pair, literally it, in most cases, it says kill anything, counter anything. Like, it's an extremely powerful answer for any type of deck. And you'll see that the players are often reluctant to fire it off. Yeah. And what's interesting about drawing the lock is that it's been legal for a while and it was basically not playable until these ropes mm-hmm. came along. Right. So, yeah. you know, it, it was kind of this weird little thing where, you know, of course they're developing sets uh, in Washington over time. And it's like, Hey, this is a card that looks good. If only it had a couple more pieces and then the pieces mm-hmm. come along and all of a sudden the card goes from unplayable to one of the best cards in the format. Yep. And you know, this is one of those classic cards too, where, you know, we have a limit of four per deck, right? But there are certainly cards that you would play more of if you could. And, uh, and, and this is one of those, like this, oh, th- sure. this would replace all of the other counters. <laughs> if you could do that. Yeah, Austin Bursevich in the chat, 2020 season grand finals champion said that sky play shame looks better than black Lotus and Omnath this game. What? Hard to, <laughs> hard to argue. Hard to argue. Shade. It does look like it might go the distance, at least based on what we've seen thus far. The shade has Sifka down to five and now has finally earned its stripes. It earned the drown in the lock <laughs> out of uh, Sifka's hand. I mean, this thing has dealt 15 points of damage so far. That's a lot. Ooh, let the battle begin. So dispute, but Sifka was kind of hoping to be able to leverage a dispute of his own here. Mm-hmm. But uh, Alexander Hain hip to the game and has three mana available. So Sifka just has to let a drown the lock go to a mystical dispute. Another victory there for Hain. Okay, well, there's a shark typhoon. All right, Marshall, captain of the hard cast shark typhoon committee. Mm-hmm. What would you, you want to hard cast it now? Kind of, yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of do too. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's like do that, then cling to dust to block the shade is like pretty tempting. Um, I, If I'm in Sifka's seat, you know, I can protect it, but then I have to leave my shark back and any removal spell puts me in a very, very precarious position, but I think I'm going for it, yeah. Oh, baby. Do it. Uh, do it, Stan. Stan got famous by winning a Pro Tour playing Eggs, an artifact combo deck that basically just did nothing. And now we've reduced him to just hard casting Shark Typhoon into potential counterspell magic or mana. I'm loving it. Loving this. Well, it is, it does look risky, but I think this is the right play for him to win the game overall because we're going to see Neutralize and then Mystical Two is going to counter that. No Shark, of course, because Shark Typhoon hasn't resolved yet. But Stan should win this battle have a blocker back, ideally, right? He thinks he's going to have the opportunity to block. Hayne might cast his Heartless Act on the Shark Typhoon token. We don't know, obviously. Oh, look at us. We're feeling it. We're getting in there. Okay. <laughs> so I guess Hayne can knock him down to two, and then Stan gets to untap and hope that he can stabilize that way? Yeah. I mean, it does look like a good situation. I'm not sure exactly what's in his yard for the Academy's Awakening. We know that he had one Soaring Thought Thief. I don't know if he's got anything else. Down to two goes his life total after into the story there from Hain. Reloads him, but with a lot of lands, but there is at least a Drown in the Lock. Unfortunately for Hain, it's one of those turns where he has to tap all of his mana and say, go. Yep. 
All right. This one could be slipping away from Hain. This is our game three decider between these two players as well. It's been a fascinating matchup between them. Now, this match is great. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying I want to watch Demir Rogues versus Demir Rogues every single round because uh, over time that would probably get boring. But I mean, if I'm watching this multiple times this week and I'm not going to be unhappy because this matchup is so strange, the back and forth between the two players about what each game is about and how they sideboard. It really is. I, I kind of agree with you. Like it tends to take a while, but in the matchup, but boy, at least we're watching relevant, you know, interesting interactions happen time after time. Right now, though, Hain, boy, oh boy, that shark typhoon, you know, when Sifka uh, cast it, he probably had to cross his fingers a little bit. Wasn't going to be able to die right away, but he was like, Duh, this is sketchy. And now all of a sudden, look at what's happened, right? Yeah. Hain had to tap out to reload. And now look at the board here for Sifka. He feels a lot better. He's at five life. He's even chipping in for two, and he's got three blockers back after that. The rest probably, I mean, I don't want to say it's the worst drawn Hain's deck, but it's less than ideal. He's going to fire it off anyway and hit Agnim's Awakening. And now with Hain at eight, remember, he was getting chipped down over the course of the game earlier. Now we got to pivot to Luris. And okay, I mean, pivoting to Luris, clear, clear it out for Duress, make sure the coast is clear. Have drown the lock at the ready, and now can Luris keep up with this? I don't know. Gonna say no, but maybe. Ooh, into the story here for Sifka. Well, this is gonna answer your question one way or the other here, Cedric, because the four cards plus the four four. If he can find a way, you know, we're we're talking drown in the lock, hard counters, just to maintain the board here. Ooh. He will win this game. Yeah. And there's a drown in the lock. Now it was three lands and a drown. So not perfect, but finding that hard counter, super, super important here for Sifka as now he could just lean on that shark typhoon to finish the, the game off. That's the plan. So I'm curious to see how Sifka wants to attack here because he could attack with all of his sharks, a seven, seven back on defense, but it looks like he's going to split the difference a little bit here. Attack for four, leave a couple creatures back. Yeah, this is a good safe attack here because he doesn't doesn't need to take the extra risk. He has many ways to kill Alex next turn either way. Hain, is he going to go for the Heartless Act now? It looks like he is. I was curious if he was going to untap and go Heartless Act with Drown up. But it looks like the answer to that question is no. So now... And Sifka is just looking to get into a fight here because, again, every time he does, he makes a bigger and bigger board state. Yep. Well, that's a little late. Okay, so how does Hain get himself back into this if he even can? Because he's I mean, a... the Ogadim's awakening is step one, but I wonder if he even has a chance here. So he also see. has the trium that he could cycle. Yeah. So like we got Luris in the graveyard to get back, but they can't block the flyers. Thieves Guild Enforcer can't block the flyers. Drown the lock and kill a creature. He's at <laughs> four. You kill a two two. You still take two four. There's still six power attacking. Yeah, even one blocker wouldn't be enough. He would need two blockers to survive. He's going to have to desperation cycle. cycle this Zagoth Triome. He did actually find another Drown in the Lock, which is still not enough somehow. He could kill two different 2-2 two -two Sharks and still die. Yeah, so this is really interesting, right? Because it makes you wonder, and this is so results-oriented, this thing I'm about to say. Firing off the Heartless Act, right, on the end uh -huh. step. Were you supposed to untap Fire Off, fire off Heartless Act to defend with your own Drown Lock to keep your Luris alive? It's so easy to just say, if I kill the 7-7, seven, seven, untap with all my stuff, I'm feeling pretty good about this, but Stan mm -hmm. found a Drown the Lock, and now he's your winner. Yeah, and there we go. Stanislav Sifka is going to pick up the next round here. So it looks like he's 2-0 and oh in the early stages. If you're just joining us here, we are watching the rivals play against each other all day. It's round robin. The players actually know who they're playing against ahead of time, and they're going to be working their way through their matches. The better record, the better it is for them as they try to knock on the door to getting into the MPL. It's a big weekend for these players. Tomorrow, if you want to tune in, you're going to see the MPL players duke it out in the same type of format and uh, it's all standard a lot of rogues a lot of yorian and uh, some spice in there as well we're going to get a good sampling of it today i'm marshall cycliff that's cedric phillips and uh, that is round number two we're going to send it over to tim willoughby here and he's going to set up our next match
Thank you, Marshall. Yeah, we got plenty more magic come for you soon enough. Uh, and the references to spicy Yorion decks are very apt indeed, because we've got two different Yorion builds about as spicy as they come uh, between these two. So we have uh, Chris Botello on Mardu Doom Foretold. So we got white, black, and red working here, and Ruinous Ultimatum getting brought along to the fore. And then on the other side of things, Jacob Wilson on Selesnia Blink. This is where the Yorians all in the main deck. No worry about companionship here. We're just looking at getting all of that sweet, sweet blink action with a little bit of Charming Prince going on with uh, all in the main deck there. So it's going to be an interesting one to see how this one plays out here. Um, let's have a look at Chris Botello's list. We see here, yes, he's got those two Yorion Sky Nomad in the main, an extra one on the sideboard, but this is a deck that can get a huge amount of value out of some slightly different uh, options when it comes to... Um, blink effects we've got elspeth going on here potentially very 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 good against the rogues we've got a good removal suite backed up by the likes of omen of the forge but then we've got these ruinous ultimatums and they could prove very very special indeed and let's have a look at the other side of things for jacob wilson jacob wilson he is working with a selesnia list that has some real spice going on also here all of the orion in the main and look at it almost every effect in this deck will see some benefit if Yorion comes along to play wicked wolf getting a chance to come back after we've seen all the work from that one alongside oko back in the day alongside the your, your skyfly apparition you've got your charming princes even the likes of lamoir visionary potentially drawing you a few additional cards while also helping ramp out that mana, because if you do ramp out that mana, you've got the likes of Ugin, the Spirit Dragon at the top of that curve. Going to be very interested to see how these uh, battling Yorions play things out. We get a chance to find out as we get our next next match coming to you very soon after these messages. Hello and welcome to the Bolt, your rapid fire introduction to the most exciting players in Magic. And right now I'm joined by Javier Dominguez. Javier, how are you? Good, yourself? Not too bad, thank you. I'll get straight into the questions. Do you have a favorite format in Magic? Uh, it used to be Legacy for a lot, but I think nowadays I just play whatever I'm playing uh, Destiny 4 tournaments, so I don't think I have like a strong, like, you know, like a favorite format. Mm -hmm. I, I used, also used to play like Commander, particularly time before, but I just, yeah, I don't think I have a favorite format right now. What do you think the best color combination is in Magic? Uh, well, for me, it has to be a uh, Sultai, you know, black, blue, and green. They are mostly the the decks I usually enjoy the most. So do you prefer aggro or control? I think I prefer aggro, like mid-range gravitating towards aggro. So probably aggro, yeah. Do you have a favorite magic art? Well, it has to be Fervent Champion for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, what was the set you started playing with? Um, Odyssey. What's uh, the best tribe in Magic? Cephalids, of course. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there another player in the league in MPL or Rivals who scares you, who you don't want to play against? Uh, it has to be Seth. It's always I, I have a good regular scheme, but it's always very scary to play against. And some non-Magic questions for you. Uh, are you a dog person or a cat person? A uh, dog person. What is the best breakfast food? Uh, well, it's easy. Uh, jamón. <laughs> jamón. Like a, a sandwich with jamón, which is like a Spanish ham. That's uh, easily the, the breakfast I've had like 70% of days in my life. Easily. Oh, nice. uh, one last question for you. Where can we find you online? I am on Twitter and Twitch with Javier D. Magic. Awesome. Thank you for talking to me. All right, folks, League Weekend still very much in action, and we're going to get a chance to see some very spicy decks here. Chris Botello, a known innovator, he's come along, the one player in the field with Madu Doom Foretold. On the other side of things, Jacob Wilson with Selesnia Blink. The one thing we know, Yorion's going to be good. Everything else, though, we're going to have to go down to the match for that with Marshall Sutcliffe and, of course, Cedric Ferrets. Thank you, Tim, and uh, welcome back here. Um, it looks like we have the names uh, flip-flopped here, but uh, 
You know, it's funny, Cedric. Chris Patello just can't put down a good four mana enchantment that has the word sacrifice on it. No matter what, if they print one, he's interested and he's going to find a way to make it work. In the infamous words of Kesha with a dollar sign, Marshall, we are who we are. <laughs> on the other side, Jacob Wilson has a really cool list here. And uh, it's one that you don't see that often uh, in the field. You know, not, you know, you think, oh, I'm playing most of my spells on my opponent's turn. It's one of those type of decks. Uh, not really the case here for Jacob playing a green white, a Celestia Blink deck here. Pretty cool. It is. Uh, it's a deck that Brian Gottlieb initially posted on social media, Twitter, about a week and a half ago. Uh, maybe maybe just flat like a week and a day ago. Whatever. The timeline doesn't really matter all that much. Andre Strasky picked it up, did really well in a CFB event, and then this deck kind of started running all over the arena ladder. Um, it is one that is really based around the food mechanic with Wicked Wolf, uh, Trail of Crumbs, and some other things going on, but also Skyclave Apparition and a lot of cards that are going with Urian. 60 cards. Not 80, so you're not going to see Yuri as a companion here. Instead, you're going to see all four copies in the main deck, which is a choice I agree with. Yeah, really, really cool list here. And again, the triumphant return of Wicked Wolf, right? Remember, that that card really had its day in standard, and then its day ended, and nobody's thought about it since. And it's like, hey, I'm still here. That's still a very powerful magic card. And, and we see it in the hand here for Jacob Wilson. On the other side of the battlefield, Cedric, what in the name of all things is going on with Chris Patello's Yorian list here? Well, you mentioned that he loves a good four mana permanent. Apparently three mana and two mana are also permanent costs that he likes as well. Maze Mind mm -hmm. Tome uh, and that black enchantment on the battlefield as well. That's Elspeth's Nightmare. It is, um, yeah. We're seeing a Treacherous Blessing being another enchantment that could be placed on top of the deck with the scribe. It looks like it's headed to the bottom. Look, this is a Yorian deck, but it's more based around enchantments like Doom Foretold, like Elspeth's Nightmare. It looks like the second chapter on Elspeth's Nightmare is going to take either Trail of Crumbs or Elspeth Conquers Death. Uh, but the key card in this matchup to me, because I don't think these games are going to be particularly short, is Ruinous Ultimatum. And the fact mm. that, that Jacob Wilson can build a really large battlefield and it takes just one card to sweep it all away while Chris gets to keep all of his stuff, that's really, really notable to me. Wow, that's, yes, extremely powerful card. Hasn't really found a solid home thus far, but you can tell, hey, if that's the type of card that is relevant when you resolve it, I mean, it, it's going to be a game breaker uh, quite yeah. easily. These Elspeth Nightmares are ticking up. You see one at two, one at, at one uh, on the chapters there. Maze Mind Tome going as well, and here comes Skyclave Apparition now for Wilson. He can pick up a non-land, non-target, uh, non-token permit with converted mana cost four or less with it. Then, if the apparition goes away, Chris will get a, a like a, a spirit or whatever. It'll be, a, it'll be an illusion. An illusion. Thank you. Yes. I couldn't remember. Uh, you know, of the same converted mana I'm cost. Definitely, I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to be wrong about this now since I said it with such confidence. No, I like that. No, you it's said. an illusion. Blue yes. Illusion. yes, yes, we still got it, baby. <laughs> In before the chat correction, too, so... Yeah, you got to play around it. God, that was good. <laughs> Cedric's on this fire is, today. This, this is the card, Skyclave Apparition, which is just... I mean, there's no other way to say it. It's really good. Yeah, it's, it's a good card. It's really, really good, man. Because we're used to the card coming back on the other person's side of the battlefield when that happens, which is often a huge liability, as it would be the case for all of the permanents that we see on Chris's battlefield. But... When they come back as like a random creature that you don't care about particularly, that's a, a much more tolerable thing. As we see Elspeth's Nightmare take out that uh, Skyclave Apparition here. Oh, look, an illusion. It's an illusion. You can there barely is. see it. The thing that Chris's deck does a really nice job of, and it's not to say that Jacob's deck can't keep up, but, you know, Chris's deck, these enchantments, they just kind of do a lot. Uh, and then when they're Blinked by urine, life is even better. But, you know, Elspeth's Nightmare, you know, it does a lot of stuff. Uh, Maze Mind's Tome, which is an artifact, not an enchantment, it, you know, it, it hangs around for a little while and doesn't mind being reset. Treacherous Blessing, same thing. Omen of the Forge, Glass Casket, same thing. So these these artifacts and enchantments that are kind of running around Chris's deck, um, they're happy 
just being cast on their own, but they can also do multiple things over the course of a game in combination with the Sky Nomad, which is kind of the idea behind this entire deck. I know Marshall coming into this, we, you know, there's the Selesnya version, there's the Azorius version, there's the Esper version, all these decks built around Urian. Don't know if this is the best one, but it sure does look good now, and Chris is already up a game. Jeez, yeah. <laughs> he just drew Shatter Skull Smashing 2 off of that Maze Mind Tome. He's at a cool 17 life with another four banked on the tome at some point. And uh, we did get to see a little flash of brilliance there, though, from Jacob Wilson as we saw the Wicked Wolf come in, eat a food, fight the illusion, and trigger the Trail of Crumbs, netting a Yorian Sky Gnome at all in one kind of value explosion over there. That yeah. said, is it going to be enough? Yeah, that's the question. And what's interesting is we work ourselves deeper into this mid-game. Treacherous Blessing is going to resolve. Chris knows what's going on in Wilson's hand. He's gotten a couple of looks at it, one from Elspeth's Nightmare, but also Trail of the Crumbs reveals the card that it takes. So the only card that Chris doesn't know about is the one that Wilson just drew, which is a second copy of Urian. Uh, past that, he's working with really, really good information here. So this will be kind of an interesting game because it's a, it feels like it's going to be a pretty long one here as these players are going to go back and forth quite a bit. Yeah, you got to like Chris Botello's situation, at least as it sits currently, with the six cards in hand and such huge, powerful options available to deal with the board that Jacob Wilson can come up with. You know, if Jacob's trying to make this into a race situation, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, it feels like he's not going to be able to win a game like that. Chris is 0-1 uh, coming into the round. You can see that Jacob has won his first round. Since this round robin, their their um, their records may not align like you're used to seeing in Swiss play. Yep. And here's a big play, though. Jacob Wilson is firing off Yorian Sky Nomad, and that's going to get back the Charming Prince that he just played this turn, as well as Trail of Crumbs for the extra food. Yeah, I'm curious to see what kind of loop we might see here. Charming Prince, is it going to remove Yorian, and then we're going to do this kind of loop-de-loo uh, that we see a lot with Yorian and Charming Prince working in tandem? Uh-oh. All right, well, the answer to my question is yes. Ruinous wow. Ultimatum has been found. Yeah, now, does he have the mana to cast it? He's only got six, but we see the Shatter Skull smashing. He needs triple white. Yes, he needs double black. And I think, yeah, there it is. The pathway will do it. He actually can just get away with going for Extinction Event here, though, can't he? Yeah, that's actually pretty good, too. Extinction Event's going to take care of the evens. Not going to solve the Trail of Crumbs problem, but it will solve the creature problems on the battlefield. Urian's going to come back. Speaking of which, we are going to see one added to Chris's hand. So Chris's life total is pretty safe uh, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this is where where Chris says, bring it on. Like, yeah. go from, add a whole bunch of stuff to the board. I'll take care of it myself. Thank you very much. And it looks like that's not even going to be the case for Wilson. He is going to fire back off with the Wicked Wolf, but that's kind of the thing that it's doing here. It, it's just Wicked Wolf. So, yeah, yeah you got you to gotta like Patello's situation here. Now he has Elspeth Conquer's death. Woo! Batello, look at that hand for Batello. My goodness sakes. It's a really good hand. The important thing here for Chris is that he actually converts these cards into having effect on the battlefield because he can have all the cards in the world, but if you can't cast them and actually have them be meaningful, it doesn't matter. Now, I think he's going to because he's got plenty of lands to work with, and I don't think Wilson's clock is fast enough, um, but we're going to find out because Jacob does have Trail of Crumbs going, which means that Jacob's going to be able to find ways to continue to pressure Chris. Yeah, and and I, I think you're totally right when it comes to th that that ends up being what Wilson is trying to do is to, is to outrace, but it's going to be so incredibly difficult, you know, little cards to, re to remember too. You see the maze mind tome in hand now for Batello, right? There's another card that, uh, gains him back a, a bunch of life at some point during the course of the game, assuming that Jacob can't close out. Yep. It looks like he's leaving up Omen of the Forge right now. As best I can tell. Yep. Well, I just, the, the biggest thing here for Chris is I, I just wanted to cast his spells. That's all I wanted to do. Yes. You know, like, fire off home in the forge here. Is it going to kill Wicked Wolf? No. Is it going to take care of the food token? Yes. Uh, and then you let it rip with the ultimatum. But, like, stuff like that. Just cast your stuff so that you don't end the game with six cards in your hand wondering, like, man, if only I just had done some more things. Just, just cast stuff. Right. I agree. Seriously, I would just be pulling any spell that I possibly could forward at this point because... That is, he is going to absolutely overwhelm Jacob if he can just simply resolve 
a few of these spells. Like this is, you know how when you're playing a game of magic, no matter the format and you're in kind of a tight situation, you often will ask yourself, like, should I go for the value play, right? The, the play that gives me the better long-term benefit, but at a short-term loss, or do I need to do what I need to do right now? And if I were Chris, I would be leaning towards the, the latter. I would be thinking, even though he's ostensibly in a relatively safe position, you know, this is where it could slip away from him in exactly the way that you described, Cedric, where you kind of go, where did it go wrong? I should have just cast everything. I didn't need to go for value. And, and that's, I think, where Chris needs to be lined up here. Yeah, and I got to remember, too. Mm -hmm. Moment of the Forge only dealing two, not three. So that's my mistake there. Mm -hmm. I think I still I think I still may have cast it maybe just to just to get on the battlefield for another permanent with Urian. But then, you know, you also take that damage from the from the treacherous blessings. So maybe that's not the best place to be. Well, we're gonna see Urian Sky Nomad hit the battlefield here. And that will reset potentially uh, no, it will. 100% reset to El Elspeth Conqueror's death as there's no mana available here for Jacob. And speaking of, it's going to throw a dinosaur in a glass casket. Not, <laughs> not advisable in real life, but here it'll work just fine. As now we see Elspeth Conqueror's death comes down to take down the Wicked Wolf. And what an amazing turn here for Chris Patello because don't forget, he's going to get three cards off of Treacherous Blessing as well. Yep. Now it feels like Jacob doesn't have any way out, right? I mean... It's getting extremely, extremely difficult now. Yeah, he drew Skyclave Apparition, but that can only hit four or less converted mana cost, so Yorian won't go away. Could get the casket, though, right? Yep. If you kill the casket, you get your you get your Bronodon back. Bronodon can then blow up ECD if you feel like if Jacob feels like that's the best thing to do. Right. It's just stinky because like the ECD already did the annoying thing, which is exile your wicked wolf, right? Like that's the yep. part you didn't want to happen. So maybe this is the turn we see the ultimatum. I'd like to see it. I'm voting for that. Yes. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. I mean, this card is so absurd. It has like a very simple line of text, right? Like, blow up everything your opponent has. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, let's do that. That's that's a good thing to do sometimes. Uh, it costs you, right? It's seven mana, all individual colors. It's very difficult to actually fire off. But if your deck's built for it, I mean, it's one of the most powerful things you can do in Magic. Yep. And, and there you go. Sense. In this instance, it also costs a life because of the Treacherous Blessing, but mm -hmm. I think that's okay. Now, Maze Mind Tome, I kind of wish we would have cast this a couple of turns ago, but I understand why um, Omen of the Forge was held up to maybe snipe a goose or something else. Um, and at four against a green-white deck, which has no direct damage, I think you're probably going to be all right. Does seem so. I, again, you know, it's felt like Chris has been in the driver's seat here. He does not want that treacherous. No. <laughs> you see him shake his head. He's had plenty of those. Uh, he, he had put another one to the bottom earlier as well. Or into his graveyard, I should say. He discarded it to hand size. Now here's the namesake, Doom Foretold. Oh no, another yeah, ruinous yeah. ultimatum on top. It's, oh, actually pretty, it's actually pretty hard to say no to that one. I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Here Chris is tempted to start attacking with the Orion, but I don't know. I feel like why? Like, if, I don't know the ways that your token can go away, but if it does and you take two from the apparition, it's like pretty annoying to not be able to cast a spell. So I guess what's kind of interesting, right, is like you could, you could omen, you can go to two, Omen an apparition, True. omen a goose, I guess, and then your doom foretold will make you sacrifice like your treacherous blessing or something like that, and you're probably stabilized and okay because again, a green white deck doesn't really have anything resembling direct damage. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, Chris is is kind of the master at walking this tight wire act, and he does attack with Yori in here, so. 
It's going to come into the red zone. Jacob's going to fall down to 18. Now we're going to see the apparition get nabbed here in response to Yorian. And surely there's no way out here for Jacob Wilson at this point. Now I think it's, uh, I think it might be too much for Jacob. Jacob doesn't know about the ruinous ultimatum. That's the draw step. Not that I think that Chris is going to cast it this turn, but with doom for told, allowing treacherous blessing to be sacrificed, the life total is no longer under duress. I'm just really, I'm really happy at the way that Chris was able to convert his cards because he had such a lead on like the number of resources he had in his hand. And he's done a really good job of converting these. I know that there's a treacherous blessing on the battlefield for a while. So it feels kind of silly to say, Hey, just cast your stuff. I just don't want to end the game, end up losing the game with like six cards in hand thinking like, Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have done that. So I just wanted to cast his spells because I think that's going to lead to a win, and it looks like it's going to. Yeah, it does. I mean, the problem here for Jacob, right, is that he's on Celestia, and that just doesn't have the ability to get this last two points of damage through undetected. As Chris Patello, he can just start slamming here. And now we see the Doom Foretold fire off as well, so he's back up to four. That's a Vivian there for Jacob, but... It looks uh, way too late at this point, as we could see a second copy of Ruinous Ultimatum resolved in one game. You don't like the chances of the opponent there. And that's actually enough for Lethal here, as uh, plenty of creatures on the battlefield. And a Ruinous Ultimatum number two is too much for Jacob Wilson, right? Has to be. Um, well, the, well, we even get the cool animation to clean things up here. So I'm looking at four, that's eight, cool. nine, ten. That's a 12 damage. Yep. That's more than enough. Plenty enough to do it. And that is Chris Patello improving to one and one in the tournament and knocking Jacob down to the same record. But Chris, with a sweet brew here, with this Mardu Doom Foretold deck, 